Lord, we're in a war. And God, I ask you, God, to make us warriors, make us soldiers, good soldiers of Jesus Christ, to war in this spiritual battle, Lord, that's raging around us. So many people are blinded. So many people are deceived. So many people are lost still. So many Christians are deceived. Lord, we pray, God, that the light of the Gospel, the truth of the Word of God, Lord, that the power of the Holy Spirit will begin to break some people free from lies, from deception, from demonic control. Lord, we pray for our great revival in these last days. Lord, we want to see another revival of truth, of many turning to righteousness, many coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, many being changed and converted. We pray that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Hallelujah. This morning, I want you to turn in your Bibles this morning. We're going to start in Revelation chapter 12. What's that? So what? Just what's on the screen. It should be. I thought I set it up for that, but... That's all right. All right. Anyway, welcome those listening by Blog Talk Radio this morning. We welcome everyone here and those listening to Fire and Grace Church. Uh, This morning we're going to talk a little bit about, I guess, what we call, what I'm going to call demonic manipulation. Um, Demonic manipulation and deception are very close to one another. But they are a little different. But they do, they're kind of like evil twins. Well, we're going to talk about that, but I just want to use this verse right here. Uh, <coughs> the verse I want to use. Oh, let's just go here. We'll go right there. Revelation 12. You there? And we're going to go to verse 7. All right, Revelation 12, verse 7. Of course, this is in an end time context, very close to the second coming of Jesus here. But he says this And there was war in heaven. Now, in heaven doesn't mean the. The heaven where God is, there's, the Bible reveals that there's three heavens. That's why you hear the word heavens. There's our atmosphere where we live. There's the second heaven, which is outer space where the planets and the stars and all. And then there's the third heaven. The Bible says the third heaven is where the throne of God is, where Jesus is seated as King of kings and Lord of lords, and where he will return from. So there's three heavens. But the term heavens also refers to the spirit realm that we don't see. See, there's the realm that we see, and there's the realm that we don't see. Now right now, to me, the most foolish people on the planet are atheists and agnostics. Because it's very clear that we're seeing a lot of spiritual activity in the world. That's why all these TV shows have come out over the years. Paranormal activity and... Uh, all these ghost hunters and all these different stuff that's going on and all these movies about paranormal activity and, and, and people being demon possessed and, uh, you know, the true stories of demon possession that's out there. Um, just in the last uh, few days, I read an article, I think it was in Charisma, that up in, uh, South Dakota, I believe it is, I got tagged in it this morning, I could probably find it, let's see. Um, but anyway, in, in, uh, 
in South Dakota, I think it's South Dakota, on an Indian reservation, there's been like 200 suicides, young people committing suicide. Well, when you go back and you look at that situation, this is on an Indian reservation, and you go back and look that there was a massacre there. There we go. Yeah, South Dakota. There was a massacre there that the American cavalry troops did back in the 1800s, and they just massacred men, women, and children this particular Indian tribe, Native American tribe, whatever you want to say. And they say that this in this article that there's also a lot of spiritual things going on there. Shadow people, they call them. The dark spirits are there. I said, when you put together what the Bible says about shedding of innocent blood will bring a curse upon the land, what that means simply is that it opens a door for demons and Satan to have legal right to dwell there to, and to afflict and torment anyone that lives there. Uh, the same goes for any type of land or house or building where there's idolatry, where there's witchcraft, where there's been rituals. I mean, any, any land or house or temple or church or any place can be defiled by sinful activity, idolatry, or, you know, the Native Americans, most of them were into worshiping all kind of different spirits. And so when you put together what happened in this place in South Dakota, when you put together the massacre that took place there and the shedding of innocent blood where they were killing men, women, and children, and when you put together the ancestral demon worship of the Native Americans there, You've got a place that's just rampant with demonic activity. And so there's been a wave of 200 teen suicides. And whenever you see mass suicides, you know some people are under some demonic manipulation. And when I say demonic manipulation, listen folks, people are being influenced and controlled through their thoughts by demon spirits. But see, this is what's so sad. Unsaved people are under the control of Satan and demon spirits. They are under the kingdom of darkness and really don't have a lot of power to resist it. But the sad thing to me and why my heart's heavy this morning is because I still see so many Christians under demonic manipulation and I see so many Christians who operate in demonic manipulation. They're manipulating others. We first need to just realize that we're dealing with very, very powerful spiritual forces and that there are only two sides to the spirit realm. There is God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, and His angels. And there is Satan and His angels and the demon spirits. Now there's difference between the fallen angels and the demon spirits, but we're not getting into that this morning. They're not the same thing. We're going we're gonna to study the book of Enoch here before long. Ooh, everybody's, you know, we'll get criticism for that one. Even though it's quoted in the Bible, right? I guess if the Bible makes it, a, a, a says it's a true prophecy from God, then I, I don't have a problem with it. But anyway, we're dealing with a world that's controlled by demon spirits. Suicide is always being influenced. Somebody's being influenced by a demon spirit, whether they know it or not. The devil is the murderer. He's the father of liars, Jesus called him, but he said he was a murderer from the beginning and he continues to be a murderer. And if there's thoughts in your head or you feel pushed to commit suicide, I can tell you right now that is not from your own thoughts. It is not from God Almighty, the Lord Jesus. It is from demonic or satanic manipulation. And you just need to understand that. Now, I didn't really, today's not really about suicide either, but you just need, need to understand we're dealing with powerful forces in this world. That's why we're seeing the demonic religion of Islam rising up and killing Christians. Now, in, in Africa, 
all over Africa, all over the Middle East. I mean, really all over the world, they're rising up and they're killing folks everywhere, beheading people. I mean, they actually believe that it's okay in their religion to torture, rape, and kill anyone who does not accept Islam. That is truly reveals satanic, demonic manipulation. I'm going to read this verse when he says here, Revelation 12, 7 again. We're going to read it again. He says, And there was war in heaven. Michael, the archangel of God, the warrior angel, and his angels fought against the dragon. Dragon's another name for Satan. Fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. I wanted you to see this because I want you to see what it says here, that Satan, the old serpent who was in the Garden of Eden, the devil, the dragon... And his angels have been cast to the earth. They hang out with us. And what is so sad to me today and constantly has me wrestling with sorrow and depression is that the whole world, he said, is deceived. Satan is deceiving the entire world. He is manipulating the minds the beliefs, the thoughts, the ideas of the entire world. How do we know that? How do we know? All we have to do is look at two things. We look at the evil being practiced in this world. right? And we look at how many people have not accepted the love of Jesus Christ that He died on the cross for our sins, that He rose from the dead, that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, took our sins in His body, did the work for us, paid for our sins on the cross, rose from the dead, gave us a book called the Bible, has proved it to be true, and all He asked us to do is to receive that by faith turn from our sins and obey Him and walk with Him. And He says, if you'll do that, if you'll come to Me, if you'll believe in Me, if you'll receive Me as your Lord and Savior, if you'll receive the cross and the blood of Jesus, if you'll believe it enough to get up off your butt and to get out of your sinful lifestyle and your sins, if you believe it enough to repent and follow Me, I will forgive you of all your sins, wash them away, throw them in the sea of forgetfulness. I will remember them no more. I will make you a son or a daughter of mine and you will have eternal life in heaven in a place far beyond what even you can imagine or even what the little hints we know of it to be. Eternal life. You will be able to escape death, sorrow, sickness, pain, Who would turn that down? But only someone under complete demonic manipulation. and control. How is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the offer of eternal life, the offer of forgiveness of sins, the offer of healing for our broken hearts, how is that a bad deal? Yet Christians, for this message of love and forgiveness of the offer of eternal life. We are the most hated people on the earth. Now I understand a lot of people hate Christians because we say, if you don't accept this, then you will be under the wrath and the judgment of God and ultimately in hell for all eternity because there is no other way to be forgiven. There is no other Messiah. There is no other sacrifice. There is no other blood that can wash away sin. There is nothing else. 
They want there to be something else because they want to have their sin and have heaven in eternity too. But God says, all I ask you to do is to give up evil, to give up your lust, to give up your sinful, wicked ways and turn to me and follow me and receive my son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins, rose from the dead. If you're willing to give up your life, your sins, your plans, your wicked desires, if you're willing to give that up and come to me, I'll wash it away and I'll help you. Not be like the rest of these demon-possessed, demon-influenced, demon-manipulated people in the world. I mean, I, I, I've been looking back at Islamic history, at world history. April 24th, just a few days ago. April 24, 2015, commemorated the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide in Turkey. The Armenian Christians were wiped out. 1.5 million were killed by Muslims. They were crucified, they were beaten and tortured and raped, driven into the desert to die from starvation. There were crosses set up on the beach where they literally nailed women, Christian women, to the crosses and had them lined up down the beach. That's happened in 19, really started in 1914, but 1915 is when it really kicked in in Turkey. This is the event that Obama, our, our Illegal president, the Muslim, wouldn't admit or acknowledge was genocide. When you systematically wipe out a group of people either because of their race or because of their religion, it is genocide. It is mass murder. Before that, I read an article of the 800 years of Islam killing Christians and killing Hindus and Buddhists in India. 800 years of massacre. And it really continues to this day. For a people, and particularly Christians, we just say, Jesus loves you, died for you on the cross. He proved He was God in the flesh when He rose from the dead. Satan is lying to you. The world system's lying. They're trying to keep you from the only one who can save you, the only one who really loves you, the one who wants to give you all eternity. But you let Satan manipulate you in, into, into loving sin. He, you let Him manipulate you into wrong beliefs and ideas. The whole world, it says. Satan deceives the entire world. This to me is extremely sad. If, if you don't look at lost and unsaved people with the, the lies they believe and the sin they want to cling to and the, and, and, and the darkness that they live in and the depression that they live in and the foolish things that they chase after in this world. If you don't look at that as a Christian who's truly been born again and knows Jesus, if you don't look at that sometime and get very sad, if it doesn't bother you, I'm going to tell you, you're lukewarm. Your love is growing cold. It should bother you. It should bother you and it should make you angry at Satan and the demon spirits. It should bother you that people's minds and their spirits, they've been so lied to and deceived. And see, you know what bothers me? There's still people that sit in this church that are not really walking with God.
That bothers me. There are people that sit in this church that I question whether they're even really born again. They might claim to be. They might say, I believe in Jesus. But I've never seen a change. I've never seen them on fire. I've never seen them saying how much they love Jesus, how much they want to live a holy life, how much they want to be a light and a witness to people around them. No, I still see some of you chasing after the world. I still see some of you lukewarm. Some of you, I wonder, did you get saved? Did you come out of darkness? Were you born again? Did you get touched and filled with the Holy Spirit? If you did, you would be different. You can believe in Jesus and go to hell. You can believe in Jesus, go to church, be baptized, sing in the choir, and still not be born again. A born again person has encountered the presence of God, the Holy Ghost. They've encountered the truth in such a way that they understand and have the fear of God and hate the devil and hate deception and hate manipulation and they hate sin and they want to follow Jesus more than anything else. They want to know Him. They want to feel His presence. They want to hear His voice. They want to follow the Word of God, the Bible. If not, either they're backsliders, either they're completely lukewarm and have departed from the faith, or they've never been saved. There are a bunch of wannabes. A lot of people think they're going to get into heaven simply because they believe, that one, they believe in Jesus. Nope. Well, I wasn't as bad as that guy. Nope. I went to church. I tithed. I gave. Nope. Are you born again? Have you been born from above? Have you encountered the presence of the Holy Ghost? Do you know that you know that you know that you know that you are filled with the Spirit of Jesus Christ and you, if you are, you will hate sin. You will hate the devil. You will hate any form of deception and lies. You will hate the ways and the wickedness of this world. You will hate it. Doesn't mean you won't be tempted or pulled by your flesh, but you will hate it and you will not want it anymore. You will understand that it will destroy you. That it will destroy you in this world and the next. You should hate something that will destroy you. You should hate whatever will separate you from God your Creator and put you in hell forever. You should hate those things. And if you love other people, if you have been saved, and you're free from the demonic lies and manipulation of the devil, if you have been set free, then you want other people to be set free more than anything else in your life. What motivated me when I got saved was not I wanted to be a pastor or a preacher or an evangelist. I didn't want to be that. I didn't even come into my head. But because I realized I had walked in darkness and lies and demonic manipulation and demonic control and wickedness and evil and that Jesus still loved me and saved me and brought me out of darkness into His light and brought me out of the lies into the truth. And, I, and when I knew He had washed my sins away and forgiven me of all the evil things and horrible things that I did. When I realized I was going to hell and I woke up and I was born again and I came out of that darkness, I realized all these people around me are still deceived. They're still in darkness. Satan still has them manipulated and controlled. I want them to be free. I want them to know what I know. I want them to have what I have. Too many people, they just won't give up. They won't turn loose. They're controlled by their flesh. They're controlled by their lust. They're controlled by their wrong beliefs and wrong ideas. <sighs> Manipulated, deceived, controlled by Satan, by demons. Jesus came and He died on that cross and He took the sins of every man, woman, child, everyone who'd ever lived to set us free from that. 
He didn't come so we could live in it and call it grace. That we could live in wickedness and idolatry and sin and lust and evil and then say, oh, I'm covered by grace. It's not what He died for. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away and all things become new. You don't get saved as an adulterer and continue being an adulterer. You don't get saved as a fornicator or a drunkard or an idolater and continue being a drunkard and an idolater. This is so simple. And yet, the majority of the world and even the majority of church people, Christians, don't get it. Because they're deceived. Are you born again? If you are, it will be evident. You will love Jesus more than anything else. You will love the Bible. You will love the Word of God. You will love the commandments of God. You will love the stuff that's hard to take. And you will love the good stuff. You'll love it all. And you'll want people to know Him too. Christianity is not about knowing about God. It's about knowing God. Knowing Jesus Christ intimately and in a real way. Do you really know Him? Or do you know about Him? Do you just believe something in your head and you think that makes you right with God? Or have you had Him fill you and you know that you have been changed and transformed? By the power of His Spirit. The Bible says in, in, in Romans 8 that the Holy Spirit will bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Do you have encounters with the Holy Spirit? Do you feel Him? Do you feel the presence and the power of God in your life? Have you ever really encountered Him and been changed. If not, you have not been born again. Now maybe some of you like me, you encountered Him when you were young in church and you really were born again at one point. You really met Jesus. It was powerful. It was real. But you were young and you just didn't know anything. You didn't learn anything. You didn't grow. You didn't understand what it meant to walk out the Christian life and become a disciple. And so you slid back into the world because that's who you you were around, all these people who were manipulating you and influencing you to do things, you know, what everybody else does. That's what happened to me. I, I, I didn't know how to live the Christian life. It wasn't that I chose to backslide. I just didn't know. I was a young person. I just, you know, entering my teenage years. No one taught me. No one ever told me premarital sex was wrong. No one ever told me adultery was wrong. No one ever talked to me about what was sin and what was wickedness and what God hated and what God wanted me to turn and walk away. Nobody explained it. No, it's my Baptist church that I went to. Pray this prayer, sign this card, get dunked, and you're good. And we don't talk about this Holy Ghost stuff. We don't talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't talk about speaking in tongues and being healed in the power of God and the presence of God. We don't talk about that. In fact, the pastor of the Baptist church that we went through, Northside Baptist Church back then in Opelika, when my dad asked him about after my dad got saved and he was reading the book of Acts and he said, what about this? When the church got baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in the other tongues and the, and the Baptist pastor said, we don't talk about that and slammed the church door in his face. And that caused my dad to fall away from God. It affected our whole family. Now sometimes, sometimes we have people in our way. 
Sometimes we have demons in our way. But folks, the true gospel of Jesus Christ will always say, this is sin, this is wickedness, this is evil, this is what God hates. Are you willing to leave that and follow me? See, folks, you're only, there's only three possible entities, we'll say it that way, that can lead you. You will either be led by the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He will always lead you into truth. He will always lead you according to the Word of God. He will always lead you into all truth if you follow Him. So you will either be led by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God or you will be led by your own flesh and desires and emotions or you will be led by Satan and demons. Now just remember this. Satan and the demons have a treaty with the flesh. Do you know that? They got a peace treaty. They work together against you. So you're outnumbered already. Unless you get filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. You get filled with the Word of God. Now, talking about demonic manipulation, right? What disturbs me is we got the people who don't know Jesus, not born again, not full of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. We understand they're under they're they're in blindness, they're in darkness, they're under the powers of darkness. God wants them to come out of that darkness into his light. That's God's desire. They're not all going to come. Matter of fact, the majority are not going to come. That's what's sad. But here's the next sad thing about demonic manipulation. Is that even after you're a born again Christian, even after you're filled with the Holy Spirit, even after you've matured and grown up a little bit and you believe the Word of God and you've studied the Word a little bit, you can still be manipulated and deceived by demon spirits if you allow it, if you open the doorways, if you listen to them. And they can work directly by speaking into your thought life or they can use somebody to manipulate you. They can speak through other people. Demons and Satan will use other people to manipulate you. Now let's just understand what manipulate means. Here's, here's a definition. And I'm just going to look at on my phone instead of fooling with that. Here's a definition I'll give you this morning, all right? Y'all all right with this? Demonic manipulation is any type of demonic influence that aims to change the perception or behavior of others through underhanded, deceptive, unbiblical ideas, thoughts, or imaginations. Here, I'll put it up here. This will be easier. Right there. Can you see it? Demonic manipulation is any type of demonic influence that aims to change your perception, your behavior, through underhanded, deceptive, unbiblical ideas, thoughts, or imaginations. See, Satan, Satan and his demons, spirits, his demonic spirits are out to manipulate us through putting wrong thoughts, doctrines, and ideas into our minds. He'll try to manipulate every facet of your life if you let him. In fact, most people 
would be very shocked if they knew the actual percentage of their thoughts or the thoughts in their heads that do not originate from themselves or God. I think many Christians right now would be shocked if they really, really knew how much goes on in their minds that's not of God. It's not even from their own thoughts. It is demonic. It is, they are satanic implanted thoughts and manipulation. You say, well, Pastor Dean, how do you know that? Just look around Christianity. Heck, all I got to do is look around this church. It's easy. With all the stuff and, that I preach, the Word, the truth, the doctrines, most of you are still manipulated constantly by demon spirits. How do I know that? Because I hear about your fears. I hear about your confusion. I hear about um, all these issues that arise. And I'm just like, all that comes from is listening to the demons. How do you know when you're being manipulated by demons or Directly or demons through people. How do you know when you're being manipulated? Simple. They will always be trying to do something to you or get you to believe something that's not true or that's not in the Word of God. Here's a simple one. Just, just a simple one, okay? I know, y'all wives, don't get mad at me. Wives, submit to your husband. Obey your husbands. Do it with a meek and quiet spirit. All right? Husband says something simple like, hey, don't mess with that. Don't lift that heavy box right there. And he turns around, and what do you do? You lift the heavy box. It might be simple. It might be small. But what is that? That is you listening to the devil. Because what the devil, he doesn't care if it's something small. Because what he's doing, he's building a house. And a house starts brick by brick, piece by piece. And he's building something. And what he's building is, he's getting you a little bit out of time to disregard what the scripture says. Until it's something big. And he causes a major argument. But he's trying to build and set a pattern in you. Right? I mean, that's something simple. Right? I'll tell you something else that's real simple. And that's just one. But this can happen for men or women here. The devil is always, and the demons are always trying to get us out of the will of God too. Or get us away from people that God knows that we need to be around. And he does this by planting seeds of doubt or distrust or offense. Let me give you an example. I've listened, I like to listen to um, some Christian talk radio shows like Hagman and Hagman and uh, Steve Quayle's usually on there. I like Steve Quayle. I've listened to these guys a lot, okay? They are brothers in the Lord. Are they perfect men? No, they're not perfect. Do I agree with them on every issue? No. But I've listened to them enough to know that they are born again believers, followers of Jesus Christ. They believe in the Holy Spirit. They believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They believe in the second coming of Jesus. They're not into any weirdness or false teaching. And yet recently, I had a woman, and well, this is really about a year ago almost. I had a woman call our radio show 
And she seemed to be on fire for Jesus. She seemed to be, you know, an, an older woman who'd been saved and come out of the occult and said she came out of the Illuminati, came out of an Illuminati family. We had an interesting conversation. She started emailing me some stuff. I thought, well, okay. But you know something? Recently, she has started, she started slowly and subtly sowing seeds, trying to sow seeds of division around the internet and to as many people as she could, trying to say that Hagman and Hagman and Steve Quayle and some of these others were not of God. In fact, she even sent me a thing saying they were into uh, the occult because he said something three times one day. Finally, I just realized, you know what this is? This is a spirit. This is a demon spirit trying to manipulate me not to listen to these men of God whom I am learning a lot from and who I know are true brothers. This is a, she's, whether she knows it or not, she is operating in witchcraft and she's operating in demonic manipulation trying to turn me against these brothers. And you know what I told her? I said, you're ridiculous. I said, you need to stop. She said, oh, well now I know. I can wash my hands of you. I said, well, wash them, baby. Wash them all. <laughs> Good. You, hopefully you won't email me anymore. Unless you're repenting of sowing division and sowing discord among the brethren. Beware if in your mind you start having issues with people you know are true brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Especially those God has, has used in your life to help you. Beware of the devil trying to turn you against those people ever so subtly. I mean, let me just ask you in here. How many of you in here, at one time or another, the devil's tried to turn you against me or Nancy? I, I, I know it. Because that's what he does. But he does this in families as well. That's why so many families are divided. Somebody, or even sometimes both parties are listening to the lies, to the rumors, to false suggestions and imaginations of demons, and all of a sudden, you don't even know why you're upset at the person. You're just upset. You need to recognize. You, you, you want me to tell you what opens the door for this being able to be manipulated? Let me give you a few things that, that allows it. Pride. What's pride? When you think you're all that in a bag of chips and other people are just a bag of chips. You think you got it together. Obadiah. Only one chapter in Obadiah, verse 3, the, the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. What does that mean? It means the pride of your own heart has opened the door for you to be manipulated and deceived by Satan. When you think you're better than other people, smarter than other people, when you think no one, can, no one knows more than you so they can't correct you or rebuke you or teach you something maybe that you need, I mean, think about this. God sometimes will use a heathen to correct you if you won't listen. Like he used a donkey with the prophet Balaam. How about that one? He didn't even send a human. A donkey. I'm going to make the donkey talk. Let's see if he'll listen to the donkey. He won't listen to me. Let's see if he'll listen to the donkey talk. Pride is a terrible, terrible block. Another definition for pride is when you really think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Well, I'm an apostle. I'm a prophet. I'm an evangelist. 
Who are you little peons over here? You're in trouble. What a lot of guys have fallen in trap into is, oh, I got a big ministry now. I got a big church now. And they can't listen, they can't hear from anybody else. And they just, and, 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 and because of that pride, I've got a big church, I got a big ministry now. And you can't listen to anybody who doesn't have at least as big a church as yours or bigger ministries. You can't, you know, you got to be in the celebrity Christianity world. Because of that, now most of them are deceived. The pride that has come in to mega church Christianity, I wouldn't give you five cents. I wouldn't give you a wooden nickel or the old slugs for mega churches out here. And what's so sad is, this is what's so sad. 99.99% of these mega churches, the people in them think that the, the teaching is deep. It's a mile wide and an inch deep. They wouldn't know a demon spirit if it slapped them in the face. They don't know how to bind demons. They don't know how to resist demons. They don't know how to cast out demons. They don't know anything. But it's deep. I've heard it, man. Oh, this message is deep. And I listen to it and I go, what? <laughs> if this is deep, these sheep are starving to death and don't know it. That's what's so bad. I guess if you starve a congregation enough, when you finally dangle a crumb of bread out there, they think it's a feast. That's American megachurch Christianity right there. We're afraid to offend anybody. Well, it's not just mega churches either. There's a lot of pastors out there. They're so afraid to lose somebody, they won't say certain things they need to say. They won't <laughs> preach on. They they all know that there is that this uh, there's a truth in the scriptures that they need to preach because their people need it. But they know it makes so and so mad, or make this tither mad, or it might divide the church, or it might cause controversy, or they might get some heat or persecution, and so. We're not going to talk about that. They're under demonic manipulation because they fear. Fear is another thing that puts you under demonic manipulation. Pride and fear. Fear of what other people think. Fear of what other people will say about you. Fear of money. Losing money. Losing a job. Fear is one of Satan's greatest manipulating tools. Fear has caused more people to be silent than anything else when they needed to speak the Word of God and the truth in a matter. Fear. A lot of Christians won't even start dealing with spiritual warfare or casting out demons because they're afraid of demons. Or they're afraid of the controversy. Or they're afraid people will call them weird or strange. Or they're afraid that the church or some pastor will reject him. The fear of rejection. Fear of losing some friends. The fear of the family members not liking you because you're willing to take a stand for certain things that they don't agree with. Listen, folks, if it's the truth, if it's in the Word of God, if it's something that's real, that's true... You cannot be afraid to speak the truth in love. In fact, if you do love, you will speak the truth. Love will not hold back the truth that people need. You're being manipulated. What's another one? Let me see what I put down here. I have to remind myself. I already talked about sin. Well, Hebrews 3, <coughs> sin will deceive you. That's an easy one. A lot of people are deceived and manipulated by the devil because they just won't turn loose to sin. We already talked about that. That's one of them. Hebrews chapter 3. 
Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. It says, lest any of you be hardened or your heart be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin will deceive you. This is why most of the church is deceived right now. They won't turn loose of sin. James 1, verse 22, here's another way you're deceived or manip- manipulated. The door's open to demonic manipulation. When you hear the Word of God and you won't do it. See, it's dangerous. Let me tell you something. This is why people don't like coming to our church. Because it's dangerous. Because once you hear the truth, you've got to make a choice that you're going to either obey the truth or reject the truth. If you reject the truth, then the Bible says you are deceiving yourself and you are opening yourself up for Satan to deceive you and manipulate you and control you. we got a lot of people like that sitting in the church. They hear the Word of God. They hear the truth. They hear what God has said in, his, in the Bible, but they refuse to do it. Uh Uh-oh. Don't shout me down now. Of course, this one's easy right here. Number four. I already told you number three, pride. Number four, selfish desires outside of the will of God. This happens a lot with single people. They want a husband or a wife so bad or a boyfriend or a girlfriend so bad or this also the sexual area. More people are going to go to hell over sexual issues than probably anything else. Because the flesh, the desires, the selfish desires of the flesh that are outside the will of God, we're supposed to wait till we get married before we get in sex. And sex is for a man and a woman. Not a man and a man, not a woman and a woman. Not two men and a woman, not three this is the way it goes. I'm, ser- I'm serious. One man, one woman, get married. That's where God says sexual activity can happen. Outside of that is going outside the will of God. But this is also, I believe, what motivated Judas. Everybody thinks Judas wanted the money. He didn't want the money. He had a plan. He had a selfish desire. He was a zealot. He was a nationalist. He, wanted, he had political means. What he thought was, I, G- I know Jesus is the real deal. Judas believed. Judas was there. He saw Jesus raise the dead and heal every sickness and disease and cast out the demon. He knew he was God in the flesh, the Messiah. But what Judas wanted was Jesus to overthrow, use his power to overthrow the Roman government and make Israel the chief nation again in the world. But he also said, well, I'll get some money out of it because he didn't care. He says, I'll get Jesus to do what I want him to do and I'll get money out of it from these Jewish leaders who, who are pansies. I'll get some money out of them. And I, hey, it's the best of both worlds. I get a little money and I'll get Jesus. I'll force Jesus into a situation that'll make him do what I want. He had an agenda. And he tried to manipulate Jesus Christ. He tried to manipulate the plan of God. And what did Jesus do? When, when, when Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane and He said, Lord, Father, not my will, but Thine be done, He submitted to the will of the Father. He submitted to do the will of God, to go to the cross, to die for our sins. That was the plan of God. No one really understood that at the time. But the plan of God, the will of God, was for Jesus to go to the cross. Judas thought, no, I'm going to get Jesus to become king. And it said... The Scriptures say they were going to take him by force. At one point, the mob was going to take Jesus by force and make him king. And Jesus slipped away because that, it wasn't time for that. He's coming to be king. But it wasn't time for that. That happens with a lot of singles. It's not time. Sometimes it's not time for you to get married. You need to wait. But because of the selfish desires of the flesh and your own emotional needs and everything else, you say, well, the first one that comes along, let's get married. More mistakes have been made in this area in the church world than probably anything else. 
That's why, you want to know why the divorce rate is equal in the world and the church? It's because the church picks their spouses just like the world does. Ouch. Right? Serious stuff. But Judas didn't work out for him. You know why I knew it wasn't the money? Because once they saw that Jesus wasn't going wasn't to overthrow the Romans and become king and, and make Israel the political power of the world again, he threw the money down. It wasn't the money he was after, folks. He threw the money down. And he realized, I have screwed this up. But it, the Bible says, and that's what this verse says, this is what I'm talking about being manipulated. Judas allowed himself to be manipulated by Satan, by the demon spirits, right here. And this is how we know it in John 13, 2. And it says that the Last Supper and supper being ended... The devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Who manipulated Judas? Satan put it in his heart to betray Jesus, but it was because Judas already had an agenda. Judas already had a selfish plan. He already had a selfish desire. He already had an agenda. He wasn't submitted to the will of God. This is where many Christians right now, you're not submitted to the will of God Whatever it may be, therefore you're open to be deceived and manipulated. Wide open. You've got to be able to say, God, your will be done, not mine. Lord, I may want this, but do you want me to do this? Or do you want me to have this? Or do you want me to go to this place? Led by the Spirit? Or led by your own desires and your own flesh? Which one? One of the two. The devil will put it in your heart though. He'll put it in your mind. I know this is the word cardia. You ladies should know that there's different realms of the heart. This is the part he's talking about about your, your mind and emotions. This is the soulish aspect of your heart here. But the devil can put it in your mind and your emotions. See, the Christian, we're going to have the devil come to try to manipulate our mind. If Judas would have said here, when the devil put it in his mind, in his heart, if he'd have fallen on the floor and said, it's not my place to try to manipulate my Lord. God, forgive me for this thought. I bind you, Satan, and get from me. They were going to crucify Jesus whether Judas did it or not. Y'all. You know that. They were looking for an opportunity. It was going to happen. Judas didn't have to be involved. Now, I know Judas was prophesied that he would do it. Or that there would be a man who would betray Jesus. It didn't have to be him. There were a lot of people looking to get Jesus. See, this is what ought to scare you right here. Judas was one of the twelve. Given the anointing to preach the gospel, heal the sick, and cast out demons. Trusted by Jesus to be His treasurer. And the devil got to him. See, some of you the devil's getting to you. It's why the Lord had me preach this this morning. I can feel it when it starts happening. It's like a snake slithering through our church, just slithering around, whispering to me. And too many of you are listening. Slithering around. And you're listening. Don't let him, don't, don't let him put something in there. In your heart, it's not supposed to be there. Don't let somebody else be the mouthpiece. See, this is why we Christians, when we, when we counsel each other or exhort one another or teach or preach to one another, we gotta be very careful. We all have influence. 
Y'all, y'all hear me? We all have influence. We all influence people. You, even you younger ones, you have influence. You will influence people. And you can influence them to what is right, to what is good, to Jesus, to the Word of God, to what will set them free. Or you can influence them toward evil or the wrong direction or something outside the will of God. What's very sad is when Christians become the tools of Satan to manipulate each other. Situation I know of where a son is manipulating the mother to cause division between the mother and the father. But the mother doesn't really see it and recognize it as she should because she's got this emotional connection. Beware, mothers. You're easily manipulated by sons. Emotional connections. Well, they're my child. Let me tell you, kids are born with this demonic ability to manipulate their parents. Why do you know the Bible even says about spanking children? It says don't be manipulated. Really, it doesn't say manipulated, but it said don't spare for their tears. It means don't let their tears fool you. Emotional connections. Boy, this one right here. I've shared this before. I know pastors. Nancy does. Used to take a stand. Stand with the Bible. The Word of God about homosexuality is sin. It's an abomination. If you live in homosexuality, you are not saved. You are not headed to heaven. You have to get out of that sin, that sexual sin. And Jesus will wash it away. He'll forgive you, but you've got to get out of it. You've got to leave it alone. You've got to come to Jesus, be forgiven, and leave it. All right? A homosexual can be saved. A homosexual can go to heaven, but they got to leave the homosexuality. Well, pastors now, some of their children, because now it's become so rampant, some of their children are getting into homosexuality. And because of the emotional connection, they're listening to the manipulation of the devil and the devil starts manipulating them. Now, now, you know, you, you, your child's not going to hell. God loves them like you love them. So therefore, homosexuality is not going to send them to hell. must be okay. I have sat in a church and heard a mom preaching. The dad was not preaching that day. I was with Nancy. Heard the pastor's wife basically say homosexuality was not a sin. And they were pastors and had been pastors in a, a Pentecostal denomination, the Church of God. The Church of God founders, I'm telling you, if they knew it would roll over in their grave. What ever manipulates you against the Word of God and against Jesus, against the truth? is demonic manipulation. And I don't care if it's coming through the mouth of a pastor, a pastor's wife, a Christian friend, or your child. If it's trying to get you to do something that's against the Word of God. Like, wives, go against your husband. Your children sometime will get in there and try to get, you know, daddy said, we're not doing this. He's at work. Children come in, but mom, but mom. Little manipulators, but mom. Daddy said we're not doing it. Well, all right, he's not here. It won't matter. No, you just taught them rebellion. You just, you, you just planted the seed. You, you just got manipulated and you just allowed them to become manipulators. You, you, you were manipulated and now you've enabled them to be manipulators and now the devil's all up in it. And it's going to continue. Now my children start trying to play that stuff. Try to divide mom and dad. Oh, it's family conference time. Mm, 
thing, you little devils. I have a covenant with this woman. You're not dividing us. I love you and all, but you, you act like the devil, I'm going to call you a devil. Division. Beware about them little mouths. Right? I could preach on this for a while. I need to quit. How do we deal with this? Let me give you this. Just to give you the, the finish. Colossians. I believe it's chapter 3. I'm just quoting it. Maybe chapter 2. Maybe chapter 4. I can't remember. Hold on. I'm in Colossians over here anyway. So let me look. I don't know why. Ah, yes. 3.16. That's an easy one to remember. Colossians 3.16. Everybody knows John 3.16. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you Richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Look at the verse before that, though, and let the peace of God rule your hearts. The problem why we're manipulated, we're so easily deceived and manipulated, or are we, we're so easily knocked off track by the devil by demon spirits is because we just won't fill ourselves with the Word of God. Because the more you know the Word of God, the more you're full of the Word of God, the more you're going to be full of wisdom. And wisdom enables you to discern and to detect when you're being manipulated or deceived. You'll be able to detect who, who, who's, trying to, who's trying to sow division. Who's trying to lie. Who's trying to trick me. Who's a witch or a Satanist. You want to have discernment? You want to be able to know what's going on in the spirit realm? Let the Word of Christ, this Bible, the Word of Jesus Christ, Genesis to Malachi and Matthew to Revelation, the 66 books of the Bible, let the Bible dwell in you richly. Know it. Read it. Meditate on it. The more you know the Scriptures, the less you will be able, Satan will be able to manipulate you out of the will of God and out of the truth. But if you spend your time in movies and foolish books and entertainment of this world, if that's what you're filling yourself with, you're going to be Easy prey. In fact, you already are. Some of you young people, you can spend four or five hours playing a video game. But you can't read the Bible for 20 minutes. You're going to be the devil's lunch. You're going to be controlled, manipulated. Don't even get me started on pornography. Some of you still looking at that in here. Tell you willing to put that down and deal with that? The devil's going to control you and manipulate you and lie to you and deceive you and set you up for some big falls. You can't plant those seeds continually. And not expect a harvest. Can't do it. What you meditate on. What you constantly meditate on. And you know what? I'm not even talking about God. Let's what, let me just talk to the men for a second. I talked to the women a minute ago. Let me just talk to the men and the young men in here. You know what? You don't have to have pornography on a phone or on a computer or on a, a video. You don't have to have pornography to be involved in pornography. Do you know that? 
Because our minds can create the pictures and the images or bring back the ones that we've seen if we allow our minds to meditate on those things. Let me just tell you guys, and listen, at one point or another, all of us have struggled, especially when we were young men. Let me, let me just go on and tell you. A lot of men, a lot of younger men listen to me. They think getting married is going to fix their lust problem. It does not. The flesh is the same. The flesh always wants what it's not supposed to have, and the devil's always in agreement with that to help it out. Right? Married, not married. It doesn't matter. You will be tempted. You will deal with this. But guys, the way that you allow your minds to constantly think on sexual images and women, if you allow your mind to constantly meditate on that and create those images, or you go and look at those images a lot, you're doing with that what you're supposed to do with the Word of God. You're supposed to keep your mind on the Word of God. You're supposed to keep your eyes focused on the Word of God. You're supposed to meditate on it continually. You're supposed to keep your eyes on Jesus and be in prayer and keep your focus on the glory of God and the image of God and the, and the Word of God. You're supposed to keep your mind and your thoughts under control. The Bible talks about the man that, that, that will please the Lord is the man that meditates on Him day and night. Continually. Your mind will meditate on something. You say, well, I can't help it. Yes, you can. If you're born again and Jesus is living in you, then He's given you power and authority to resist it, to bind the demons, to rebuke them, to cast down the imaginations, to control the thoughts. I've preached on this several times in this church, but this is, this is paramount to living the Christian life. You have got to control your thoughts and bring your thoughts back to the Word of God. And if you don't read the Word and meditate on the Word and learn the Word in your heart and get it in you, you will not win this battle. And some of you are going to have to get rid of the internet and the phone if you can't stop it. We live in a society, listen, I understand, we live in a society that is completely saturated 24-7 in everywhere you look with sexual images. I mean, I, I, I won't even bring up this, the, the sickest, disturbing thing that I've, I've seen this week. I can't because children are in the room. I, I'm, I'm blown away by where this world is willing to go with sexual perversion. Let, let me just tell you this. All child molesters and rapists, most all of them started with pornography at a young age. Look, look at all the people, like, like all these kids that went down to the beach, Panama City, spring break. Look at all the rape cases that are now being prosecuted. You don't want to know why there's so many, there's so much rape well, you didn't. When I was in school, yeah, we were crazy, but we weren't raping people. Now that's become common among teenagers. Rape. Why? Because they've been feeding on pornography from the internet and their phones and everything else since they were very young. What you meditate on, what you constantly see, what you constantly think about, what, that is what you will become and that's what the devil will make you. Now I know some kids, listen, some kids and even some adults struggle with these things because they were molested when they were children. They were messed with when they were children and they have struggles. I understand that. But this is a fight that you better win. And you can in Jesus. You cannot by yourself. You cannot do it. You will not win this battle, male or female, against sexual lust and immorality. You will not win this battle without Jesus' help. And God is merciful and He's patient and He will forgive you and He will help you. And Faith Marie, you're going to get a spanking when we get done with this if you don't behave. I don't care if everybody heard it. You will. You don't act up in church. You know better than that. 
This is important, you guys. You know why I preach on these things? Because I want everybody that hears my voice to make it to heaven. I don't want you to be deceived, lied to, believe lies. I don't care if they come out of preacher's mouth. You know there are preachers that will tell you it's okay. You can be an adulterer. You can be bound in homosexuality uh, uh, in, uh, and, and, or you can be bound by pornography or you can be in premarital sex and just live in it or you can be a drunk. They'll tell you. Oh, you, you as long as you believe in Jesus, it's okay. You'll go to heaven. That's a lie. You're being lied to. You're being manipulated. Demonic manipulation. The truth will set you free. When you fear God enough to deal with it, when you respect God's Word enough to start saying, I got to deal with this problem. I got to deal with this sin in my life. I got to deal with it. I got to repent and turn from it. That's when you're headed in the truth. But if you make an excuse, well, God loves me anyway. Well, God will forgive me no matter how much I keep doing it. No. No, friend. You're deceiving yourself. Admit it and quit it. You hear what I'm saying? The Bible is clear. No fornicator, no adulterer, no homosexual, no drunkard, no idolater, no drug addict. No one that's living in these sins habitually practicing these things will enter the kingdom of heaven. And he says, let no man deceive you. Ephesians 5. Galatians 5. 1 Corinthians 5 and 6. Revelation 21, 7 and 8. I mean, just over and over. That's the Scripture. That's the truth. And if you have the fear of God, which the Bible says is the beginning of wisdom, the fear of God means I understand that if I continue in these sins and this wickedness and practicing these things, that I will be judged and I will be damned and I will be separated from God forever. Not because that's what He wants, but He's told me I've got to stop habitually practicing these things. And through the blood of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God, you can grow and get strong spiritually and resist living in those sins habitually. You can do it. That doesn't mean you will never sin, but it will not rule your life every day. I know some men who live for Jesus and they don't struggle with pornography every day of their life, but then they have a bad day, boom. I have them talk to me. I get the phone calls. I have to go out of the room sometimes so my wife and daughter don't have to hear me talk to these guys. And that's so I understand. God's not going to condemn you for a fall. But living in it, don't let, don't let anything be your master except Jesus. Sin shall not be your slave masters. What the, that's what Romans 6. Don't let it be your master. Amen. Through Jesus, we can overcome the slave master of sin. You hear me? We can't in our own strength. Cannot do it in our own strength. Never will be able to do it in our own strength. A lot of people that were through willpower. That's why so many alcoholics, they go through Alcoholics Anonymous and, 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 and they struggle and struggle and they end up back and forth and back and forth because sheer willpower alone can only keep you for a while. But when the sun sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. I love it in John 8, what he said. Jesus said to the Jews that said that believed on him, that had faith in him, if, that big old word, if you continue in my word, the word continue means abide, live, dwell in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Amen. 
And he's in, he's in the context. The next verse he says, He that commits sin, or the word there in the Greek means practices sin, is the servant or the slave to sin. The devil and the demon spirits want to make you a slave to sin so that they can separate you from God and damn you into hell forever. That's what Satan and the demons, their ultimate, all their lies, all their manipulation, all the media and the entertainment and the, all of this world's stuff is all to get you to become a slave to sin. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross. Only the blood of God Almighty taking on a human body. Only the blood of God, the blood of Jesus could break the powers of Satan and sin. And if you'll walk with Him and obey Him, He will give you the truth, the strength, the ability to not be a slave. Amen? Amen? Say this with me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name through the blood of Jesus. I do not have to be. A slave to sin. Or the devil. Or demons. Or his lies. You don't have to be. You can be. But you don't have to be. Because Jesus has given you power and authority to resist the devil. To cast down the imaginations. To make the demons flee from you. That's what these, these, all these kids that are killing themselves. Somebody needs to go to this reservation in South Dakota and preach the gospel of Jesus. And talk about the power He's given us to bind the demons and cast out the demons and to drive away the suicide, the depression, and the, and the pain. That's what they need. They don't need a powerless gospel. They need a true gospel. They need the real Jesus because the only thing that's going to drive away these demons of depression and death and suicide and these ancestral spirits of the, of the Native Americans, the only thing that's going to drive away these demons is the power of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the only thing that will deal with Satan and these, and these spiritual forces out there. There is... There is no hope. That's why this world is so messed up. Buddhism is not the answer. Hinduism is not the answer. Islam is certainly not the answer. And dead Christianity that denies the power of the Holy Spirit is not the answer either. If you have a Christianity that doesn't even talk about demons... Or, or binding demons or casting out demons or the reality of spiritual warfare. Get away from that Christianity because it's dead. It's dangerous. In fact, the Bible says turn away from it. 2 Timothy 3. See, a lot of people think I'm mean. But if I find a Christian or a church or a pastor that tells me that the gifts of the Holy Spirit we're done away with. The Bible tells me to run away from that person. Get away. Get out of that church. You know why? Because they're going to get you killed. They're going to deceive you. <coughs> I know. Y'all think I'm harsh. I'm sorry. I'm just going to straight up tell you. 99.9999999% of your Baptist churches, your Methodist churches, your mega churches are dead. Empty shells. They are tombs full of dead men's bones. Whitewashed tombs. I remember someone saying that. You say, well, well, there are people that are saved in there. Oh, I believe it. I got saved in one of them too. But if I'd have stayed in it, I would have died. 
I'm sorry. Say it's harsh. Say it's mean. Say it's divisive. No. He said, read it, babe. You got it? 2 Timothy 3? Did you look it up? Verse 5, what does it say? They'll have a form of godliness or Christianity, but they will deny the power thereof. Dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit. From such, turn away. Hear what I'm saying to you. If your church says the Holy Spirit gifts and power and dealing with devils, casting out demons, healing the sick in the name of Jesus, resisting the devil, spiritual warfare, if they deny the tongues and healing and the gifts of prophecy and these things, if, if your church denies the power, dunamis power, that's the word, dunamis, the miracle power of the Holy Ghost, if they say, that doesn't happen anymore, we're done with that, it says, turn away from that. Ouch! That's good preaching, Pastor Dean. How many of you in this room would be where you are if you hadn't learned how to fight the devil. How to cast the demons out. Deliverance. I had a pastor trying to tell me that the gifts of the Holy Spirit and God didn't speak to people anymore and the gift of prophecy the word of knowledge. I said, well, only, we only need the Bible. You know, we only need that God doesn't speak and give us direction. I said, hmm, so you pastor such and such church in such and such city. I won't say. I'm being nice for the moment. I'm having a nice moment. But I said, you, where did, I said, where in the scripture does it say you, John Doe, are supposed to pastor in X city at X church? How do you know that? Where, where does it say in the scripture? Can you show me where it says that? He said, doesn't say that. I say, exactly. So how do you know you're in the will of God then? If God can't communicate with us, if He can't give us, reveal His will, either by a dream or a vision or speaking to us or by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, or if, if God can't communicate and somehow He's lost power, and He's communicated with men and women for since He created Adam and Eve, I said, how do you know you're in the will of God? You don't know nothing. You don't know anything. You just chose. Hmm. Could be some of that wood, hay, and stubble that's going to be burned up. A lot of men and women are doing stuff God never called them to do. There's a lot of pastors, pastoring churches, never called the pastor. They got manipulated into it. Somebody said, oh, you'd make a good pastor. So they go to seminary and become a pastor. Guess what? They were never called to do that. You can get manipulated into something that seems good and you aren't even supposed to do it. Right? Let's pray. We can get out of here. Father in heaven, I ask you to reveal the truth of your word. You have not changed, Jesus. You are the same. The Bible says the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, I'm praying in Jesus' name that people even here, people listening to my voice over radio, through the internet, those who will listen to this message, Lord, especially if they've never really surrendered and given their lives to Jesus, that they will do it and truly be born again. And that is my desire more than anything else, to see people converted, truly saved, truly in love with you, Jesus, truly following you, truly giving their lives over, believing the gospel that you died and rose from the dead, that you paid for sin, and that through faith and repentance, they can have that forgiveness and they can start a new life that has hope and power and a real relationship with you. Father, touch people's lives right now. I'm praying that even in this room, in this church, 
those that have been on the fence, those that are maybe even not even truly born again but think they are, or those that are slipped, that today they would get their lives back right with you, confess their sins, ask for forgiveness, and begin a walk that's according to the Word of God and according to what you want for their lives. I ask you to do that in each person. In Jesus' name.